Bell Island boom. CBC newsman Rick Seward brings us the story of the unusual atmospheric explosion which occurred last April. The story doesn't begin in Newfoundland, Land, but in the United States. They call them the mystery booms. They began the same day, December 2nd, 1977, a thousand kilometers apart. 9.30 in the morning at Charleston, South Carolina. Half an hour later in New Jersey, and again that afternoon at 3.45. There were more throughout the month of December, shaking homes and terrifying people. By the end of the year, there was a tremendous amount of pressure on President Carter to have the cause of the booms investigated. So the Office of Science and Technology in the White House asked the Defense Department to look into it. The Defense Department, in turn, got the Navy to do the job, specifically the Naval Research Board, a massive research organization involved often in a top-secret military. On March 3rd, they stopped. On March 3rd, the Navy report was released in Washington. The booms were blamed on supersonic planes bouncing sonic booms off the upper atmosphere. They had stopped off the United States, but not in Canada, where the Transport Department is concerned. Well, it, it, it confuses me. If in fact Neil Stanton has had problems explaining where the booms off Nova Scotia are coming from. Most appear to be supersonic, but in many cases, there were no supersonic planes around at the time. What's more, the con Yet, there are no booms reported from the Cape Race area. Moving the Concorde's track out to sea did nothing to stop the booms. Still, more than ever, they appeared to be man-made. After the end of February, in fact, about the beginning of uh, March, uh, the booms disappeared just about completely. There were a few scattered reports of bangs, but very few at all. And then about the middle of March, they picked up again, but uh, at a much reduced frequency and uh, a much less uh, loud character. The, the loudness had seemed to have gone and had been replaced by rumbles and uh, very dull thuds and very much more like distant thunder. In addition, the time of day had shifted. In January and February, they were more common uh, in the morning from 9 o'clock to noon with a few in the afternoon. Then in uh, March and up until now, it appears that the uh, center has now shifted so that it's around noon to about mid-afternoon. There are still booms heard in the morning and at night, but uh, mostly now it's around noon to mid-afternoon. If they're not all supersonic, what's causing them? Here at the Lamont Observatory in New York, there's a suspicion the military are behind many of them. You know, they, uh, they took Christmas week off, they took weekends off, so it looked like a normal... Uh, workday activity of, uh, of this country rather than uh, of some foreign power that wouldn't be concerned with weekends or, uh, or, 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 or our observance of the Christmas holidays. Dr. Don and his team of scientists record sounds in the atmosphere with very sophisticated equipment. One boom they recorded last December over New Jersey left a tracing just as big as one left by an exploding oil refinery a few years ago. Dr. Dunn is dubious that ordinary sonic booms could do that, and he's been picking holes in the Navy report. Uh, they initially said that the special atmospheric conditions allowed the booms to be channeled from great distances. I disagree with this because the conditions were not that special and there was nothing new about the conditions this year. There are some events that have not yet been explained. For example, during the main boom season in this country, there have been many uh, observ uh, observations of uh, nocturnal balls of light in the sky associated with booms. And uh, some were seen by respectable and responsible authorities, like, like airplane pilots, who are usually uh, good observers. I know of only about a dozen such observations, and there have been scores to hundreds of the no normal daytime booms. Since most of the booms occurred in the daytime, we don't know if they would have had flashes with them or not. But there was a daytime boom with lots of fireworks. One Dr. Don hadn't heard of, the Bell Island boom. Bell Island, rising from the waters of Newfoundland's Conception Bay. Known once for its iron ore mines, the U.S. Energy Department is now thinking about using its abandoned mines 
as a storage place for an emergency supply of Western crude oil. The people who live here are a long way from Dr. Don's New York Observatory, so he missed hearing what happened that day back in April. 11 o'clock on a hazy Sunday morning in April. Yeah, well, it was a terrific explosion so sudden that it was just like a, a blockbuster it dropped, like they dropped them in the parachutes there in London, eh? You know, and the parachutes was a terrific explosion and uh, shook the house, eh? The boom was heard 65 kilometers away. Somebody had started their fireworks again. I was standing right here by the table and the fire came out of this, I guess with electricity you call it, the fire came out, I suppose, about 18 inches out across the table here. It's got a blue fire, eh? Blue flame. Lights came on, fire came out to the socket here, and then bang out that boom, eh? All over the tiny settlement of Lance Cove and Bell Island, people reported things like that. Television sets all of a sudden appeared to explode and began smoking. Electric motors burned out. Little balls of fire came out through the glass and oven doors. Even an old clock that hadn't worked in years, wasn't even wound up, suddenly went mad. Most frightening of all were the fireballs. Well, first when I sat, I just, myself, I thought was something happened to the world or someone dropping bombs or something. Well, it was about three feet in diameter and it was a circle and it was well, mostly blue, but had a little bit of orange on the edge of it, which sort of like sparks, little tiny sparks coming from it. And then, Three buildings were hit by something, in one end and out the other. This was a TV set. A barn, oddly blown apart, no burns. Dead chickens, bleeding from the eyes and mouth, no burns. Nearby in the snow, three depressions, one like a rabbit hole, the others about four feet across. Just before the boom, some people heard a sharp noise, like a tone while across the bay, people saw a strange beam of light strike the island. It was like a white streak, you know, in, from the sky, toward the land, slanting towards the land. Scientists later guessed enough electrical energy had been spent here in a fraction of a second to supply the city of Montreal for up to six hours. They came from as far away as New Mexico and New York to investigate. Their conclusion? super lightning. Oh, it was a very, very strange phenomenon, all right, but uh, so far as I can make out, there's no hint of anything other than an electrical phenomenon. It was a discharge. It was a lightning of kind. A very unusual one, and an enormous one by comparison with other lightning effects. The balls of fire, reported miles apart, ball lightning. The description of the flash in the sky, unreliable. Super lightning is a new term used to describe unusually intense lightning, a thousand times more powerful than the ordinary kind. It's been recorded lately by military satellites for the past couple of years, in fact. The flashes were said to be unusual over land. Many people on Bell Island refused to believe it was lightning. No way that was lightning. What do you think it was? Explosion. It sounded like an explosion. Yes, explosion definitely was an explosion. I thought the whole house was gone in two. I thought it was the end of the world, so help me. Really did. That was the end of the world. When you keep Bell Island in mind and go back over the accounts of the other booms along the Atlantic seaboard, many of them sound a lot like that. For some reason, many of the reports of booms involving lights have originated here in New Jersey. And one of the most memorable of such reports was last December in this community of Tom's River. The military insists Tom's River experienced an electrical transformer, something many residents accept. But others, those who directly experienced the event, aren't so sure. About midnight on December 12th, professional weatherman George Propolis watched an odd flashing in the sky. What it was 12th, professional weatherman George Propolis watched an odd flashing in the sky. What it was, was it was very brilliant. It was brighter than the, the normal lightning. In other words, for it to be this brilliant and this bright, which was almost white at times when it lit up, it would have to be associated with a very strong thunderstorm, which would have very heavy rains and very, uh, very powerful, uh, thunder, uh, very powerful uh, thunder associated with it. And incidentally, around the entire county that night, there was no uh, rainfall uh, or any uh, 
uh, thunderstorm activity reported. Across the bay from where George Profilus lives, Bob Levy didn't see any flashing, but round about the same time, he began feeling strange and later experienced something he'll never forget. The smoke detector went off just for a, uh, a brief instant. Uh, it was followed by uh, what I call an explosion, uh, the intensity level of which was tremendous. I don't know any other way to put it. I mean, it was, uh, it was a boom. I bolted upright in bed, looked down the hall through the bedroom door in the, in the direction that the sound had come from, and as I did, at a distance of about 20 feet, I have these sliding glass doors that lead out to a back terrace, uh, and rather heavy drapes covering the doors. Through the drapes, I saw a, a perfectly symmetrical ball of light. Uh, I don't know if that's what it was, but that's how I describe it. Um, just for the briefest instant. And there are more than that. When you go down the list of them, it's clear that many of the so-called booms are actually more than sonic booms. They often involve these balls of fire, flashes of light, electrical activity in the atmosphere. It almost seems as if there are classes of booms. This man is probably the world's most respected climatologist and geophysicist. He's just finished a seven-month study of the booms and concluded there are different types with different causes. Uh, Senator Shelton and I have been looking at the East Coast booms, the so-called mystery booms, over the last uh, seven months, and we've come to the conclusion that of uh, 600 separate and distinct booms, uh, about two-thirds of them are due to supersonic aircraft, Concorde, or military aircraft, but that one is explained by man-made activities. Dr. McDonald thinks many of the booms could be forerunners of an earthquake. The Bell Island boom, he says, resulted from a high-level thunderstorm that people on the ground weren't aware of. And in that violent thunderstorm, there was a gigantic bolt of lightning, I suspect one of the largest ever recorded in history, that came down and uh, gave rise to the very intense noise and to the uh, electrical activity that was uh, clearly observed at the, at the ground. Dr. McDonald rejects outright any possibility of military involvement other than supersonic aircraft, but other scientists aren't so sure. It crosses everybody's mind. It's not unrealistic to think that uh, either American, Canadian, or Soviet weapons testing could be in back of some of the obscure phenomena that are known to take place. Occasionally, uh, it is known that uh, one side or the other has tested weapons, which is then objected to by the other side. Uh, these are all within the realm of reasonable speculation. Just how serious is the concern about the military? Well, scientists who are aware of some of the research underway could be excused for wondering. Some of the things that we came across in our hunt for an explanation for the booms sounded like something right out of a science fiction movie, but it's no fiction. The ideas we're about to discuss and the scientific work we refer to are genuine. The fact that reputable scientists even remotely think that such things could be related to events like the booms is in itself a disturbing comment on our times. A few years ago, Dr. McDonald wrote a paper theorizing ways man can alter nature's energy and the environment, including ways to affect the minds of whole masses of people. Another possibility, one that, uh, that is related to the uh, Bell Island case or has been uh, thought about is the triggering of a particular kind of electrical waves in the atmosphere that can affect uh, human behavior. Uh, as, as perhaps you know, the, the brain has electrical activity and that uh, has a particular frequency, that is, it uh, changes regularly about ten times a second. And if one could uh, uh, change the natural electrical activity, one can change uh, behavior in that way. How does that relate to the Bell Island? Because um, there, the hypothesis has been put forward by some that Bell Island was uh, uh, related to electrical transmission of a very powerful radio wave originating 
presumably in the Soviet Union directed towards Havana to uh, provide for communications or something, and somehow that triggered the Bell Island case. Uh, one could think of a similar powerful radio wave uh, used to affect uh, human behavioral characteristics through the interaction with the brain. Uh, my own assessment, and it's a fairly detailed and technical assessment, is that this is presently impossible, that one uh, doesn't uh, have the technology or is likely to develop that kind of technology to achieve that kind of control any time in the near future. In the same paper, Dr. McDonald warned of research into ways to use nature as a weapon of war. The military have always been interested in the weather. An official of a naval research facility once boasted, we would regard the weather as a weapon, and weather is as good a one as any. The Navy was instrumental in developing techniques used to alter weather during the Vietnam War. They denied it at first. But it was going on. Operation Popeye, Operation Intermediary, Operation Compatriot, different names for the same thing, a weather war in Southeast Asia. Clouds were seeded over North Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. There was flooding, and thousands died. The Americans made it rain acid and grease. Dr. McDonald is well known as an outspoken critic of the military uses of weather, and he's largely responsible for this a treaty outlawing environmental weather modification for military purposes. He now says the military are not as interested in weather modification as they used to be. Uh, as far as I know, the uh, United States Defense Department is not pursuing any in, uh, studies to use environmental modification as a weapon of war. Would you necessarily know, though, if they were? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily know, but uh, having been associated with the subject for as long as I have, I, I feel fairly confident that I would uh, have heard of uh, such activities if they existed. But when it was more fashionable back in 1974, a scientist in Nevada wrote a paper on a way to create artificial lightning using something he called a pulsating electron beam. After the article was published, he was approached by the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Air Force, and the Russians, who liked the idea and thought it could be applied to weapons research. He doesn't know if they ever did develop his idea further. Would the four years or so that have elapsed since have been enough time for someone to perfect your device if they had continued working on it? I heard only said one colleague of mine from Cornell University, he told me once, that was a few years ago, said he wanted to make an experiment to test that idea for beam propagation. This is rapidly. For military purposes? Or? Well, uh, I don't know for... Um, uh, I understand also there's some classified research going on, of which I'm not familiar. It's top secret? I suppose, yeah. I don't know, because I have not been uh, involved in it. Mm -hmm. I know only that people had approached me. Dr. Winterberg's ideas were only a small part of a new concept in weapons research that has since developed into an awesome advance in mankind's search for bigger and better weapons. This is a concentrated beam of light called a laser. The weapons potential of such beams as lasers and electron beams has been known for some time. The problem has been how to transfer a concentrated beam of light called a laser. The weapons potential of such beams as lasers and electron beams has been known for some time. The problem has been how to transfer huge amounts of energy along the beam over great distances. Scientists have been secretly working on it and they're getting there. Oh yeah, definitely. I think one has already succeeded uh, drowning uh, small planes with uh, laser beams. And of course, the same thing should be possible also with charged particle beams. One great advantage of charged particle beams is that they normally have a very high efficiency, whereas laser beams not always have such a high efficiency. So I would definitely think that it could be used as a weapon uh, with uh, anti-ballistic missile defense uh, very far down the line, still many years away, I would say. I don't think presently it is possible, but of course, think about spaceflight was considered to be impossible, and it's today a reality. This is a laser tank. From the dome on top, it fires off laser beams that blow things up. The dome on top of this plane is also a laser weapon used to blow things up from the air. The research involves more than that. President Carter's arms control statement for this year is highly censored, but by reading it and other documents, we can get a pretty good indication of what's happening in the United States. There's concern that the West has become so dependent on vulnerable satellites for information, 
And in fact, there have been reports that the Russians have already attacked an American satellite with a laser beam, perhaps to demonstrate their superiority in that field. When Dr. Winterberg was pondering the possible causes of the Bell Island boom, he wondered if it might be related to research like that. But on second thought, he thinks it's quite impossible. Now, I only pointed out in principle you could discharge a very large lightning by a laser, but also by a charged particle beam, by making, so to speak, a sh shortening the cloud against the ground. But the most likely explanation is that, in fact, it was an extremely unusual lightning, which, f for very lucky circumstances, we were able to so observe here. Of course, you never can say some, somebody is not doing it, but I would say uh, it would require a, a very large uh, space platform or something like that. So I would, I would say we can very likely rule that out. John Mulpaz and another geologist, Ken Collerson, thought the Bell Island boom had been caused by a meteorite at first. But after meeting up with a couple of scientists from New Mexico on Bell Island, they don't know what to make of it. Mulpaz thought they behaved strangely for scientists interested supposedly in observing a purely natural event. One peculiar thing that happened was that um, one of them came up to both Ken and myself, um, after a few minutes, I guess, just we were leaving, and uh, asked us if we were clear for security. Well, some words they've had, I can't exactly remember now, but asked us if we were clear for security, and we didn't really know what to say. You know, I mean, it hadn't occurred to us that there was anything, anything like this involved. The scientist turned out to be from Los Alamos, a nuclear research facility working on top-secret weapons research, energy, and lasers. This is where the first atomic bomb was developed in secret during the Second World War. They were aware that something like this might happen, although they didn't know exactly where, but they were aware for about a week beforehand, and uh, they were kind of looking out for it. Now, you're saying that they indicated to you that they suspected this event was going to happen a week beforehand? They suspected that they had come to the conclusion that something like this may have happened, may, was due to happen, as far as I can make out, that's what they said. So I asked one of them afterwards, I kind of said, um, well, how did you know about it? How did you know it happened? How did it come up so quickly? Because it wasn't broadcast all over the place. And I said, did you notice it on the satellites, satellite images? And they said, yeah, they picked it up. I think it was on two, he said, on two photographs. They picked up this explosion. And they were really surprised when they got here that there was so little damage. They, they'd actually thought with the, with the force of what they apparently picked up on the satellites, they thought the place would have been flattened. The two men from Los Alamos, John Warren, a plasma physicist, Robert Fryman, a weapons design engineer. His specific job we couldn't find out. He describes himself as a theoretician. Fryman wouldn't give us an interview, but here's his side of the story. At Los Alamos, they're working on thermal nuclear energy confinement, the process that's thought to cause lightning to form into a ball. If they can store energy, it can be harnessed. He admitted saying he expected the boom was going to happen, explaining that he'd had a hunch about the weather. He said there'd been several similar events over New Jersey and South Carolina. Super lightning that had been occurring over the ocean for some reason had moved over land, and he thought there might be a connection. When it happened over Bell in Washington asked him to check it out. He wouldn't say who. The visit was unusual in another way. It wasn't arranged through channels. Through the American Embassy and the External Affairs Department in Ottawa, the root government scientists are supposed to follow. The visit of the Los Alamos scientists added another dimension to the Bell Alam boom, a dimension that to many is a cause to think, to others, a cause to forget. Yeah, I think maybe that, the reason for that was that we realized that perhaps there was something a little deeper in it than, than we care to think at the time. And uh, both Ken Collins and myself kind of decided upon ourselves that maybe we, we keep out of it and, and let the powers that be, whoever they might be, sort of 